All of those apostles died martyrs death. Meaning by that, they stood before Roman soldiers and the Roman soldiers said, say Caesar is Lord and live, or else maintain that your Jesus is risen from the dead, that he is Lord and we will kill you for it. And every single one of them said, Jesus is risen from the dead, we've seen him, he is Lord. And they died, not for a belief. They died, not for a sincere feeling. They died for what they claimed to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. <coughs> Study psychology. The evidence is people will not die to cover up what they know to be a lie. Look at Watergate. Three brilliant, powerful American lawyers, Dean, Ehrlichman, and Haldeman, tried to participate in the Watergate cover-up. Under the penalty of some years in prison, they all broke and said, it's a lie. They were not willing to suffer too much in order to cover up the lie. People will not die to cover up what they know to be a lie. They'll break under that pressure how ridiculous it is to posit that those disciples lied about the resurrection of Christ, but then they were willing to die for what they knew to be a lie. Highly implausible. I debated Dr. Michael Newdow twice now. He's trying to get under God out of the pledge. I think that if, I told Dr. Newdow that if he put his faith in Christ, he'd have more people supporting it. Because there's a large group of followers of Christ, like Roger Williams, who began the state of Rhode Island, who defines separation of church and state as meaning there should be no mention of God in any government track. Other followers of Christ in this country insist no, to have under God in the pledge and on our money in God we trust is just fine. It's not forcing anything down anybody's throat. There's freedom. Sir, I can promise you, the United States of America is not following Jesus Christ. We have in God we trust in our money, on our money. What a joke. We don't trust in God in America. We trust in money. That's the bottom line. And that's sad. And yet that's a very f deliberate decision that we as Americans are making. And I think the Arab world laughs at America and I don't blame them for laughing. When I went overseas, I was so embarrassed. The number one export from the United States that I saw was pornography, <laughs> slick pornography. You talk about being embarrassed as an American, gosh. So to try and argue that America is a Christian country, I would never do that. Do you think that'll open us up for attack from other, other countries, more terrorism? No, I don't think that. I, I think that America's already made its mind up. And I pray that we'll change our mind and come back to Christ and back to the living God. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, we, uh, Jesus put it real simple. He said, repent and believe. The Greek word for repent is metanoia. It means to examine my life, to go over my life with a fine tooth comb, to acknowledge I have a problem with evil. I've become self-centered. Instead of having God at the center of my life, I've placed myself right at the center of my life. Christopher Lash wrote a tremendous book called The Culture of Narcissism. I agree with him. We are a totally self-absorbed culture. I mean, I really could give a rip about you. If you can help me get ahead, if you can make me feel comfortable, oh, I'd love to get to know you then. But if you're of no use to me, Forget it. I'm all out for number one. We as a culture, we as a people have made the art of looking out for number one, a fine, fine art in our culture. And Jesus Christ says, guess what? That is a total violation of why I created you. I created you to love God and to love people. 
And to love people means I begin to put the goals of other people before my own. I begin to put the agendas of other people before my own. I get, live my life as a servant. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Just ask yourself, why am I here at the University of Texas getting an education? I'm afraid there are too many of us that would say, simple, I'm here to get an education to get the pot of the gold at the end of the rainbow, to get my slice of the American dream before there are not any more slices to go around. That's really empty. To think that the purpose of your education is simply to position yourself to make more money. Give me a break. Don't you think there's more to your life than that? Jesus says, yeah. Jesus says, God created you to get a good education, to develop your mind, and to make a lot of money. But by golly, you better make all you can, you better save all you can, and you better give away all you can. Because God has you here for a purpose. And that purpose is to share, to build up others, not to have a love affair with myself. That's really hard. But man, is it rewarding. Man, is it exciting when you begin to follow Christ that way. Life begins to open up. Just think about your family. Come on, guys. You know how painful your family was, many of you. You know that mom and dad divorced, and you know how deeply it hurt. Well, guess what? God didn't create it to be that way. And guess what the number one reason for divorce is? It's because I'm going to do it my way, and I could give a rip about her. And if she doesn't do it my way, I'm going to give her blankety blank and get her out. And I'll divorce her. And I'll go out and get somebody else who turns me on a little more. And then you destroy children's lives in the process. And some of you will never, never escape the scars of growing up in that type of home. And Jesus Christ says, you better start thinking. You better start thinking about breaking that pattern and using your life to serve Christ and to serve people. And when you bring children into the world, to love them, to serve them, and to build them up. But it takes commitment, it takes sacrifice, and that's hard. But the reason I'm pleading with you guys to consider it is, just look back over your life. Look at the people who've invested in you, who have loved you, who've given of themselves to you. Isn't that really what makes life go round and round? Of course it is. But it's hard, because I get lazy, and I just want to stimulate myself and my nerve endings and be comfortable. And Christ says, watch out. That's a pathway to hollowness. And that's the path our culture's gone. It's sad. Christ says, come on, wake up and smell the coffee. Start thinking a little deeper. You think we're living in times? Are we living in the end times? Great question. I do not know. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, no, no one knows the day or hour of my return, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the time the flood came and swept them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or hour of my return. I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I do know that he is coming, because he promised to, and he keeps his promises. He said, I'm going to die and rise from the dead. The dude pulled it off. He's no liar. He is reliable. You can trust him. Thank you, sir, for raising those thoughtful issues. He was an alien. Jesus was not a man. All right, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait to think now. If you're really claiming to be a thinker, let's go at it. Wait a minute. I'm not claiming to be a thinker. I'm a sayer. You claim to be a thinker. You're the one that's telling everybody, you know, that God's going to come down to heavens and, you know, if it was going to happen, it would happen 2,000, 10,000 years ago. You know? Cool. Oh. Do you set the time schedule for God to operate on? No. Well, then you why know? are you saying it had to happen 2,000 years ago? Because if God was going to happen, it would happen already, man. Well, wait a second. You're putting yourself in a position of saying, God, here's the timetable. Who do you think you are? Well, who do, who, who, well, you know what? You know who I think I am? I think I'm a person who knows who God is. Good. How have you found out about God? Because God is in here. God's not up there. God's in here. God's in here. Yeah. Okay, well then who is God? If God's in here, who is God? Me. Thank you, me. But wait a second, did you really create the cosmos? Look, man, it's a, it's a concept. The concept of God is in here. If God is love, and I love people, and I love, I love myself, and I love every human individual being as a, as a person, 
in the Quran, it is said that the word was delivered to Muhammad, to Isaac, uh, and all the other prophets. But it is man's misinterpretation of these words to cause fighting amongst men. Now you take that to George Bush and your right wing, you know, and tell them, does God really want us to be fighting amongst ourselves? Is this what Jesus would have wanted? I say no. Okay, well, how do you know what Jesus was if God's just inside you? Oh, give me a break, man. Look, I got a, I got a bus to catch, man. You started popping, not me. You started is, this, I did. Bottom line is, is that God exists in everybody. And it is man's misinterpretation of these which cause fighting amongst men. And that is exactly what's going on now, man. All right, but wait a second. Let me ask you. If God is really in him, and if God is really in me, if I saw Paul back and smack him in the face, what just happened? Part of God just hit part of God. And you wipe out the basis for understanding that hitting him is wrong. If what you say is true, I'm trying to take you seriously. Are you really? Yes. You're telling me that God's inside of him. He's part of God. God's inside of me. I'm part of God. If I hit him, what's wrong with that? Part of God just hit part of God. First of all, it's illegal. Second of all, it's inhumane. Well, so what? Oh, so if what, what you say so is what, true. So what? So what? So it, 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 it's okay for us to go uh, invade another country and, and, and impose our imperialistic thoughts on a, on a whole other people, and you wonder why they're fighting back at us? If we're and, all and, part and, of and, God, and, and you get, you what's get, wrong with it? You got a two-star general saying in person that we, as, as American people, are a Christian government and that our God's better than their God? Give me a freaking break. Man. If we're all part of God, if what you say is true, then George Bush and every general is part of God. Saddam Hussein is part of God. He's a, a serial man. killer He's is a part of God. Devil. You're the one who said it, not me. Hey, wait, Believe hey, me, hey, I don't hey, agree with hey, you. Hey, didn't, didn't, didn't what's his face take a uh, uh, job on him and ask to go out and kill 7,000 people? Was that an act of God? Yeah, it was an act of God because how else did he take a and jawbone him and ass and go kill 7,000 people. I mean, it wasn't 7,000. Well, whatever. If you're talking about Samson, he was a strong dude, no doubt about it. Oh, so, oh, so, 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 so. If, if what you say is true, that we're all part of God. So he's use a strong arm. If, if I have a racist attitude towards this gentleman, what you're saying is, what? I'm part of God, he's part of God. So what's wrong with why, it? Why should I have a racist attitude towards this man? <laughs> because you grew up in the South. You're full of <laughs> Your neighbors have racist attitudes. So what? The well, so if what you say is true, that we're both part of God, what's wrong with me having a racist attitude towards me? I'm part of God, he's part of God? It just happens, man. So what's wrong with it? Think. You think about it. All right, that. I will think. Let me explain to you. No, no, you know, I'll tell you what's wrong with racism. <laughs> what's wrong with racism is this man has been created by God in the image of God. I have been created so by God in the black? image of God. No, I'm not saying that. You, in the image of God, means saying, my the image of God. conscience. That's right, not I'm physical not, image. I'm, I'm not using an example, but you know what? What? Hey, why is it that every picture of Jesus is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, six-foot-five-inch person when we all know that he was a probably, that picture probably was probably a by white racist, that's exactly. why. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Probably from the South and probably Baptist. Good, all right. So, don't put your faith in the white Jesus of some Southern Baptist. Instead, read the Gospels for yourself and realize that Jesus was not a Southern Baptist. Realize that Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jew. And obviously I was trying, you see, obviously this man has expressed a worldview that a lot of people hold to today. And that worldview says we're all part of God. But think what that means. If I'm part of God, and if this gentleman is part of God, if I haul back and smack him in the face, what just happened? Part of God just struck part of God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just what this part of God decided to do. You see, Gandhi broke company with Hinduism, because Hinduism teaches this. This is just a Western form of Hinduism that this guy was espousing. Gandhi understood the caste system, the idea that I'm superior to this other human being who's inferior because of karma, is wrong. It's wrong to look down on another human being. But you see, what Gandhi had to do was he had to leave the Vedas and the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, and he had to embrace the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't embrace Christ totally, I don't think, but he had to key in on the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is based on the view this man is not part of God. This man is not part of God. We both are created by God. God has given us equal value, equal dignity. Therefore, if I haul back and slap this man in the face, it is absolutely evil because it is unjust. 
It is an attack on the dignity of this man, and the only reason this man has dignity is not because I'm some enlightened white man who finally has realized that black people are just as valuable as white people. Baloney. Human dignity is based on the fact that all human beings, regardless of their ethnic heritage, are created by God for a purpose. And God created me for the purpose of loving and respecting this man, and to haul back and smack him in the face, to even have a racist attitude towards this man, is sinful, evil, and God is so irate about it, that's why there's a hell. Because God is good, God guarantees that evil is not going to ultimately win. But you see, if I have a worldview that says, oh no, we're all part of God, I can haul back and smack him. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just part of God, smacking part of God. Jesus Christ says, hogwash. Jesus Christ says that we all have dignity because we all are created in the image of God, but guess what? There's responsibility. And the responsibility is that I better treat this man with dignity and respect. And if I don't, God will judge me for it. And he'll hold me responsible for it. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm an atheist and I'm, all, I'm okay with all that stuff. Life is an accident. There's no meaning. Morals are, well, I don't even use the term morals because that implies a God to me. I have ethics. Uh, they're arbitrary. My life is an accident. And, and I go on. Well, sir, I'm real glad that you go on. I'm real, I'm real glad that you've not committed suicide. Have you contemplated suicide? I've, I've thought about it logically, if that's what you mean. I've come to the same conclusion that it makes no difference one way or the other. Logically. Great. Well, I respect you highly for that. And my simple plea to you is, can you really live out your view of moral relativism? I do. Okay, how can you live that out when you're confronted by evil? Or what you consider to be evil? How do you respond? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by evil. You know, all right, I, let's say... I would consider that you misleading all these people to be evil in some sense of the word. Okay. How do you respond to the rape of a woman? Um, I have my own feelings that I have inside of me. I attribute them through logical progression to evolution. And I react to people being hurt, to myself being hurt, in the same way that you do. I have a different interpretation of that, but my interpretation of that is consistent. It doesn't depend upon a god. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't require any outside agency to explain the way the world is. It's here. I'm here. I have certain drives to reproduce, to uh, feed myself. I understand those. I do them. But, but if it's true that morality is relative, and if the rapist defines rape as being good, what do you say to the rapist? Well, I, I lock him up to keep him from doing things that bug me. That's, that's my right as part of the predominant thought in the society as far as that goes. The uh, laws are what, what bug people enough. The law says it's okay to be bugged by that. Hey, so what I've understood you to say is, confronted by a rapist, I lock him up. Keep him from doing it again. Okay, if so might makes hit, right. If, if, well, that's the way the law works. If, if okay. somebody wants to hit me with a club, I don't like that. That hurts. I, there is no moral judgment on this person. He's doing something that's going to hurt. I don't want him to do that. I don't like him. I don't like him hurting other people. Because there's no morality involved. I have an ethical code for how I treat other people because that's the way I want to be treated myself. That's right out of the Bible. So what happens when a bunch of people define rape as being good? Well, I, you don't tell them they're wrong, do you? You just tell, tell them, well, that's your opinion. I happen to disagree. I have a different opinion. But you're not wrong. I'm not right. I'm not right. You're not wrong. It's all relative, right? The logical sense of that is correct. Yes, yeah. I agree with that logically. There's no problem with that. Okay, I have a problem with people, that. People having... A lot of people have actions that I disagree with. Okay. It doesn't make them wrong in any moral sense because right. there's no ju as far as I'm concerned, there's no God to judge. Exactly. So I I can try to convince them of my point of view, 
Uh -huh. Some of them, it's possible to do that. Society tries to convince people that the behavior you're doing is not acceptable in our society, so don't do it. If you do it, we're going to lock you up. This, is, this doesn't have as much to do with God as you make it out. This is society protecting society. Fine. I'm not saying that God tells me that rape is wrong. It's not my point. My point is I have a conscience. And when I'm confronted by certain types of behavior, my conscience informs me that is right, that is wrong, that is good, that is evil. And then when I do things that are wrong, I experience guilt. My conscience informs me that what I did, the way I treated that person, was wrong, and I experienced guilt. And if someone steals my bicycle, I look them in the face and say, you should not have stolen my bike. Not meaning by that, you know something, buddy? The United States government has passed a law that says, don't steal my bike. When I say you should not have stolen my bike, what I'm appealing to in that other person is not an understanding of constitutional law. I'm appealing to their conscience, and I'm asking them to be sensitive to their conscience and understand that to steal the property of another person is really wrong. I, I doubt that if somebody steals your bike, you're being really sensitive. You want to hit them or do other nasty things to them. The law is the set of rules that we can enforce about how to behave. Some, you don't try to convince somebody the moral incorrectness of stealing your bike. You get your bike back. And you do the same way as, as much as I do. I operate the way you do. You're partly right. At times when people steal from me, I feel like knocking their block off. You're partly right. But I can promise you, sir, there are many people who have done me dirty who I have not knocked their block off, not hated them. I have tried to touch their conscience and ask them to reconsider what they did. And I do that almost on a weekly basis, sir. Well, it sounds like I have more inner peace than you do because I, I don't feel that with people. I don't hate people. Inner peace? Yeah. Sir, if I were in your position, I would have no inner peace. Because if I were in your position, I would have to acknowledge that if someone steals my bike, that's their definition of good. It's not wrong, it's not right, it's all relative. And if someone rapes a woman, that's not wrong, it's not right, it's just all relative, it's their definition of right and wrong. And I would hate to be so judgmental as to take my arbitrary prejudice and lay it on somebody else. I don't see where you get off doing that. If morality is really just a crapshoot, if it's all just relative, why do you seek to lay your relative prejudice, your relative bias, on somebody else? Well, that's a good question, and I do wonder that. Why do you try to lay your God prejudices on the rest of us? No, that's not the question on the table right now. The question on the table is why, if you're convinced that right and wrong are totally relative, or just a matter of personal opinion, and I know it's getting hot in the kitchen, but please don't hop out. Stay right with me. If it's true that morality is relative, then why? Why what? Why do you get so upset with someone who does wrong? I didn't say I get upset. I stop them from doing the things that I don't want them to do. I may take action collectively with somebody else to, to help stop actions that I disagree with. Why do you lay your relative prejudice on other people and try to stop them? They're not doing something that's absolutely wrong. They just have a different opinion from you. Why do you I'm, lay your I'm, opinion on others? I'm agreeing with you every time. I'm, I'm no, you're not. With you're not getting the point. The point is that if it doesn't matter whether we steal from this gentleman or not, if I steal from him and if he says stealing is wrong, I'm not going to steal. If I'm a moral relativist, then I'm going to have to acknowledge there's no difference between what he and I are doing in any absolute sense. And I said, yes. He chooses not right. to steal. I choose to steal. It really doesn't matter whether you steal or not. In a moral so don't get all the pot true. under the collar. Just chill out, be cool, and realize for some of us to steal, that's good. For others of us to steal, that's wrong. I, I'm not sure why you're missing the point. I agree with you. No, you don't agree. You just told me that if someone steals your bike, you want to knock their block off and no, you want no, to put no, them in no, prison. No, no, That's no. what you said. I didn't and I'm telling you, but chill out. Don't lock anybody in prison. That's not a nice thing to do. If someone wants to steal your bike, that's cool. That's their definition of good. I, I think, so just chill. I think most of the people here heard me say that I, 
I'm not upset by that. No, you just want to lock their block off and put them in prison. No, I said I Come don't. Come on, man. I said I don't want to knock people's blocks off. That doesn't occur to me. You want to lock them in prison? That was that was in reference to rape. Fine. Actually, the point is, you I know very well that you can't live out your moral relativism. I don't like if it. If you're in a friendship with someone and this friend starts lying to you and dissing you, you're not going to say, oh, well, that's cool, man, I understand. That's your definition of right and wrong. And so you want to treat me and so live and let live. It's yeah. all relative. And you live? No. You, you live say, like buddy, that's wrong. Don't do that. You're putting words in my mind. I don't say that. Okay, fine. What do you say when someone disses you, when someone steals from you, when someone lies to you? What do you say? Well, you, you, you said that person was my friend. I, you know, how long is that person going to be my friend? Why would I want to be around that person? Um, maybe I choose my friends more carefully than you do. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, as a follower of Christ, have no option but to love even my enemy. You're all right. I don't hate anybody, and you admit that you flare up a lot. Oh, come on. Give me a break. You don't hate anybody? I sure do. I know. I you never hate you. anybody? No. That, that's, not a, that's not an emotion that I have. If you come at me with a stick and try to hit me, I'll try to stop you. And That's what do you call hate. that? Defense. Avoidance. Of and you never experience hate? No, it's a foreign emotion. All right. Speaking for myself, I do. When someone goes at me, I'm convinced that that's wrong, and I have to struggle with feelings of hatred, feelings of animosity, feelings of anger and bitterness. Why do you struggle with that? Well, I thought you, God cr corrected your behavior. If you if you don't change because of God, because of Jesus, where is your, what's the purpose of this? I don't understand. Sir, I don't think we're really communicating very well because my whole point was, God is in the process of changing me. I need his help to change. And yes, sir, I am changing. And yes, sir, I am loving my enemy more and more, but it's hard for me to love my enemy. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case in the early church, or at least the apostles seem to sort of make a quick switch. No. That's the indication I get. The apostles were human beings who struggled with a sinful nature, who tried to submit to Christ and allow him to change them. In Romans chapter 7, the apostle Paul is brutally honest, and he says, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So, Paul was very honest about his moral failures and his need for Christ's forgiveness and for Christ's help to change. So nobody sees any big and obvious re change in behavior from being a Christian. Not even the apostles. Oh, yeah, no, there's a lot of change in behavior, <laughs> but nobody's perfect. I certainly am not perfect, but are there changes in my behavior? Absolutely, yes. Jesus Christ has radically changed my behavior. But he won't give you the inner peace to stop hating people. Oh yes, he gives me inner peace, but too frequently, when I seize the ball and try to run on my own, it leads to a lot of problems. And I still struggle with that. And every human being that I have ever met <laughs> confesses that as well. Not everybody. Except you. That. You never hate. It's hard to believe that you've never met anybody else that's logical. Right? Oh, you know, you're right. I have met a, I, I met a student at MIT who, in front of his classmates there in that lounge at MIT, said, I am morally perfect. I never do anything wrong. All of his MIT students burst into laughter, and I had to suppress the smile that was coming across my face. So the overwhelming evidence is all of us struggle with evil. All of us. Every single one of us. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian novelist, as he lay on a bed of straw in a prison camp in Siberia, came to the understanding, quote, the line separating good from evil does not run between parties, classes, and countries. Rather, the line separating good from evil runs through every human heart. When Solzhenitsyn understood evil is not just a Leninist problem, evil is not just a czarist problem, evil is not just a communist problem or a capitalist problem, evil is my problem, then Solzhenitsyn understood, I need outside help, I need a savior, and Solzhenitsyn converted to Jesus Christ.